Hi, my name is Tyler, poster of the Fox Valley Film Critics and Operational Manager of Group Think Productions. This week in our inaugural episode, we're going to be talking about Citizen Kane, the first in the line of the AFI's top 100 movie list, and the newest Star Wars anthology film, Rogue One. Stay tuned. Brought to you by Group Think Productions and FBTV. Joining me for this inaugural episode is the lovely AJ. Oh, I talk? Yeah, you're welcome to talk. Oh, well, hi. I'm AJ. AJ has been a good friend of mine for a long time, and he was kind enough to join us for our inaugural episode to help us talk about our films in question. Any initial thoughts? I'm excited to get going. I'm a relative movie infant, kind of just got into movies a couple years ago, but I'm watching as many as I can to catch up to where you are. We talk with, we talk with them very confidently. We, we have very long discussions about the various films we that's, get into. That's true. We've gotten into a couple rather ugly arguments. <laughs> One of them may have involved a chair. I can't confirm that, but. Was it a chair? I don't know. I still have the bruise, but <laughs> it was. Uh, let's anyway. just say we don't talk about The Magnificent Seven ever again. We don't talk about that. Anyway, for our first, as I stated in the intro of this show, our first, episode, er, our first movie we're going to be discussing is part of our initial series, which we're going to be discussing the AFI's Top 100 Movie List. The first of which is, of course, the classic Orson Welles film, Citizen Kane, which, in our conversations earlier, you had some interesting opinions on. Well, yeah, kind of one of our first conversations we ever had. I kind of butted in because I heard, oh, movies, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to enter in this conversation. And... Uh, yeah, you guys were talking about Citizen Kane, and I was, again, kind of new in my uh, movie knowledge. I was like, I don't think it's all that good. I think I had seen it once, and uh, I think I listed One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest as uh, one that was better than it, and at the time, I thought it was uh, the best movie of all time. The scorn that I was feeling at that moment was incredible. <laughs> you have no idea. I, I'm the kind of guy who absolutely loves Orson Welles. I think he's one, I don't know if he's necessarily the greatest filmmaker ever, but I consider him among the top echelon just in terms of his ability to tell a story, even if, 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 it's, even if it's something more complicated or more, I don't know if Citizen Kane, Citizen Kane would count as his most complicated film, but it's definitely the one that's the most you know, unique and polished of the bunch. He's done... Shakespeare, he's done noir thrillers, so he, he can basically do anything in, in, in terms of what he wants to do. Well, absolutely. He's a great talent and uh, very multi-talented, as you were saying, like, got his start or came, rose to fame uh, doing the radio production of War of the Worlds, I believe. He is, um, he, I've been listening to Pulp, the, uh, not the Pulp, he, the uh, radio broadcast of his old show, The Shadow, recently, mm. which is, which was the vigilante hero that Batman ripped off, which is a controversial <laughs> subject. Uh, one of our, for our, our future guests will probably have something to say about that, but you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But, Can yeah, he, he did that, and that was one of his first shows, which was very pulpy, and, but it was really fun. It, I, listening to that is really interesting. And then he got called into Hollywood, which he was given one of the most lucrative film contracts of the time ever, because that was in the midst of the studio system where everyone had to obey the rules. Everyone had to obey these, like, strict rules about the, the way the system works and how you can shoot films, so everyone had to go through the process. And you, you know, I'm sure you know all about that. Not really, but I, I just know that it was, uh, it was extremely kind of a, a very streamlined process, kind of like Korean boy bands now. <laughs> Korean, Korean boy bands it's are like, the it's, 50s Hollywood of it's today. It's kind of like the way Disney's internal politics works. Uh, it, it, well, basically, you, they would, everything was controlled by the studio, and they would pump these films out in like months. Like nowadays, it takes oh, yeah. two years to yeah. make a film beginning to end. Those, then it would take months. If they had two stars that had good chemistry together, they would star in scores of movies together, it seems. Totally. And Citizen Kane was definitely one of the, was probably the first case of an auteur film, although, he, although Orson Welles despises the idea of auteurism. But it was the first case of a director giving, outside of, inside the studio system, being given like full control over his film. And I think it works really well. It's, it's a very unique kind of film where everything about it is kind of awkward 
when like, in terms of traditional storytelling because it's not told like a traditional dramatized story where you introduce a character, character has a drama, and then you see that drama play out. It's it's being the framing device of the film is you're being told everything that's happening through based on it's essentially these like shadows of people because the first shot of the film of the people who are telling the story is the newsroom shot where mm -hmm. it's completely enshrouded in darkness. Most of the time their faces are even more obscured and whenever the characters go into the room where we meet the characters that are actually telling the, the story of Charles Foster Kane, you're, spoilers alert for everything by the way. <laughs> we were, yeah, we're gonna ruin everything. Just in case you're worried about a 75 year old movie. <laughs> People haven't seen a lot of old movies, so that's... that's Which is a shame. I mean, I, I love to look at where, where we got the movies that we have now. Totally. That we hold in such high regard. Yeah, but yeah, everything... The, the framing device is very odd for that movie. So, every, as I was saying, everything is obscured except for the story itself, which is the story of this business tycoon and him essentially becoming the most powerful man in the world and a man who over time loses all of his values, loses everything that made him a good man to begin with, and, and just eventually become this broken down shell of his former self. Yeah, a good old rise and fall story. I, you, it's clear that Martin Scorsese took a lot of uh, inspiration from Orson Welles and Citizen Kane. You can see that in Raging Bull and Goodfellas, Casino. It's, you know, he, he really pulls on that theme quite a bit of, of the, the rise to power, the excess of power, and then just how it can ruin your morals and your life. Well, Scorsese's films tend to play a lot more, a little more traditionally in terms of storytelling, though. Like, Goodfellas is a very laid out story. It's very just true. It, the execution is, and the way it's shot and the color mm -hmm. grading, that's what makes that film unique. It's not that, it, what makes Citizen Kane unique is that it tells this very simple story around such a complicated, like, way to tell, tell it. And they had, I believe it was John Ford's uh, cinematographer on board, and he did, he came up with all these unique ways to do uh, the, uh, the shooting for it, like mm -hmm. he, I, as I rec I read the the book on uh, one of the, one of the books on Citizen Kane recently. He like he found a way to make every every shot in focus, like dip like even at distance. Which, as someone who's shot films myself, that's incredibly hard to do. I can imagine, yeah. So nothing, nothing. There's no, there really aren't that many points outside of maybe maybe one or two moments where there's anything out of focus on screen, which is very difficult. The, I, the one, I did notice recently when we watched it last weekend. There was one complaint I had is that I. I didn't like any of the music, but... Which is surprising, because you look at his, his uh, films later on, specifically The Third Man, and just the ingenious score that you, you really don't hear in, in many other movies. A lot of kind of, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, I'm not well versed in musical terms enough, but like a kind of a flamenco type of guitar that drives the noir, the noir plot. Or, or Touch of Evil, which uh, is very kind of uh, Latin fit based, which mm -hmm. has that very kind of south of the border feel to it. Yeah, it's interesting that he draws on that, but it's nowhere to be found in Citizen Kane. Well, yeah, well, Citizen Kane isn't about people living on the border between the United States and Mexico. It's about a rich multimillionaire in New York, so. True. True. And yeah, you talk about the cinematographer, um, John Ford's cinematographer, as you say, and uh, it, it's clear that that's one of the bright points of the movie, or should I say dark points, because it's um, shot in black and white, one of the most beautiful black and white movies I've ever seen, just because the, the lighting in it, um, shrouding so many characters in shadow, kind of leading to the intrigue that you want to know more about these characters, and, and you want to know more about how Kane turned out the way he was, and the people around him, how they were affected by him. Yeah, totally. I, that, that lighting definitely does kind of affect the storytelling in ways that most modern movies wouldn't try that. Mm. That's, I think that's one of the advantages of black and white, though, is that you can definitely do color grading much more. You can't do color grading black and white, duh, but you, you, you can definitely do lighting as a much more pronounced sort of thing. Which oh, absolutely. You can't do the shadows of old noir films in modern day films and have it have it that classic look where you just see the guy's shadow running down the, um, the, the whatchamacallit, the aisle, or, run, or it's not like running away from the bad guys. Right, right. And yeah, you, to shoot in darkness uh, like that, you have to have some sort of uh, cinematographer like Roger Deakin did in, uh, oh, in totally. Sicario. That was a great way to shoot the, the pitch black darkness um, and made you feel like you were right there. But Citizen Kane has you feel like you're, you're, you're in the room, but you're, you're a witness. And yeah, like I said, you, you just want to know more. You're constantly wanting to know more. How, 
how these people that, they're, that the reporter is interviewing, how they came to be. Do you think that the fact that the, uh, the reporters themselves aren't dramatized is a weakness of the film? Um, not a weakness. I think uh, to kind of build on their characters and more and, and put them more in focus or more in the spotlight would crowd up the film more. It wouldn't have been as expedient of a film, definitely. The film is the film is breakneck essentially with its pacing. It really is for for the scope of it, and it's it's spanning an entire man's life. It's it falls probably short of two hours, and uh, that was something I thought about when we watched it last weekend. Is uh, that I would have I, I I want to know more about him, which is a fantastic I think plus of the movie that that you you want to know more but it's interesting how many points of his life it doesn't really touch on it it, it speaks of the great depression um and and how that uh ruined a lot of his his empire uh but it really doesn't go into it as much as as you would think as such an important part of american history sure yeah well the, the original script was like a thousand pages long and he like pushed it down into like a little much shorter one so there's you definitely lost a little bit but I think you can see that. Well, that's all we have time for to talk for Citizen Kane. When we come back from this commercial break, we'll be talking about our first, uh, our first uh, full movie review for a new film, Star Wars, the recent Star Wars movie, Rogue One. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to the Fox Valley Film Critics. Now, we're, now that we've done through our initial discussion with the AFI film, we're going to start jumping into uh, Rogue One, the new Star Wars movie that just came out. Yeah, Rogue One, the uh, first in the many to come anthology movies. Probably going to get them until the next century, unless they make a bad one and they decide to give the properties to Marvel. Oh, goodness, that sounds terrible. I mean, I, I wrote a review on the, uh, the Antisocial Critic blog a couple of days ago about my thoughts on Rogue One. And, I bas and basically my thoughts kind of summarize this. The movie is less interesting than the circumstances by which the movie is being made. If, does that make sense? Does that make sense? That's, uh, every, I wouldn't say entirely true, but I know what, what you're getting at. Every discussion I've seen coming up to the film hasn't been on like, well, with two, one or two exceptions. It's mo it hasn't been about like what the content is. It's, it's about, like, is this, is, what is the movie functionally? Is this a cynical cash grab? by the largest entertainment conglomerate on the planet. Is this... And growing. Yes. Is this um, a chance for Disney to do some risky alternate genres with the Star Wars universe? Is this a chance for them to give Star Wars movies to less to newer directors that, though, that way they don't ruin the, the mainline Star Wars movies? And my answer to all three of those is essentially yes. <laughs> It, it is an incredibly cynical movie. It, it's, it does bother a lot of people that this is a Star Wars movie that's not, that's annual. Which I can, I can totally understand that anxiety because Star Wars has always been a semi-annual thing where you see it every three years at most. And I think that's a good thing that they're at least keeping the, the, the saga films uh, scattered every other year. Um, I'm sure there are numerous Star Wars fans that are, have no complaint about the Star Wars movie every Christmas. It's uh, like the Lord of the Rings in the early 2000s, kind of a little Christmas present to every nerd. Yeah. Speaking of those, I did say in my, um, in my review a couple days ago, I, the films I most compared this to were The Hobbit Trilogy and Prometheus, in the sense that... Eesh. Yeah, well, I don't say that as a bad thing. I actually like those movies. I say that as in, as in the sense that it's the film where everything I love about it involves imbibing in the world and the content of the movie, where the, the superstructure of the storytelling, the characters, you could take it or leave it, but just the tone and the visuals and the world, it makes it fun to imbibe in, like... I always loved the first like half hour of the first Hobbit movie more than any other part of that movie because it's just Bilbo hanging out at his house and then the dwarves come in and they wreck the entire house and it's just this fun little hangout scene where you get to like meet the characters and talk and learn about their personalities and about the world and it the it, it, same goes with Rogue One where the first half of the movie is basically completely dysfunctional <laughs> and the because the film because the characters aren't that interesting. Uh, Felicity Jones as Ursa, Ursa uh, Jen Ursa is pretty good, I think. Did you like her? I, I, I enjoyed her performance. I, I th there were a couple times when I think it was more a, a director's choice than an acting choice where she got a little too melodramatic. 
But it's Star uh, Wars, it can be as melodramatic as it wants. Well, I like I like chewing true. scenery. It is a space opera, but uh, at at times, uh, I, I or I think overall, she she was uh, compelling enough. Um, uh, it unfortunately we're at a pretty sad point in Hollywood where it's tough to get uh, compelling female-led roles or female-led movies and to get them well written enough there are, there are a few writers that can really um, kind of make them truly empowered and uh, I think this movie did a, a very fine job of that at least. I know I have to sound like I'm scorching the earth from which this film came, insulting it so nothing can ever grow again, but I, I had some very strong complaints with the film. As I said, I liked it a lot. I, I also said I liked the Hobbit movies, so take my opinion as you, <laughs> as you wish. But I, I, the th again, the things I liked were the content as opposed to the actual characters because I felt that about halfway through the movie I had this weird realization that I don't know anything about these characters from a personality perspective or what their motivation is within the movie. We get a little bit, I think, for it's Diego Luna's character where he says, you're not, we're, 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 like, spoilers all the way. We're like, we, everyone's lost something here. And it's like, okay, it's kind of hinting at a backstory, but it doesn't actually go all out into explaining it. But half of these characters, we meet them fully formed, and then they don't explain any of the circumstances that led up to how they got there. And with, with a couple exceptions, K2SO is really, really good character. People actually kind of felt sad when he died. And um, I'm spoiling the movie. <laughs> it, it's a movie it's that's been set... for days. Yes. It's a, it's, it, for those who... Are, we didn't discuss the story. For those who don't know, it's a story set in the prelude to the fourth Star Wars film. So it's all about how the Rebels got a hold of the, uh, of the Death Star plans at the beginning of that movie. So... Right off the bat, you kind of have the idea that Olsi's character is either going to A, not be around for episode four, or B, die. So uh, that's, I mean, true. Going into that, I knew that as well, um, which is why I guess I, even though I loved the character, I didn't think K2SO yeah. was, was the name of it. Um, that didn't break my heart as much as it, as it may have somebody going into it thinking that this is going to be another space romp where we were just going to go along the ride with the protagonists and enjoy, and just enjoy the ride. Um, but I, I think for the most part, I, I know what you're saying about the characters, how they kind of were introduced and joined the team very quickly, um, almost, uh, even though there is an obvious overwhelming antagonist in the, in the Empire that um, they're all kind of forming against. I think they, the characters uh, outside of kind of Jyn Ursa, who was almost blackmailed into joining this, and uh, the pilot of the ship, I, I don't remember character names. Excuse me, I'm, I'm horrible at character names. I could watch a movie a bazillion times and forget the main character's name. It's just a thing with me. It makes the mistake of assuming we know too much about these characters going into it, and it doesn't take the time to really build them and kind of let us grow to like them as much. Jyn Ursa sort of has that, but she doesn't have much, that much personality built around her. So Unfortunately. Yeah, and most of it just comes from Felicity Jones's charisma, which is really good. Uh, Absolutely. I, I've loved her ever since uh, she started as... Uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's wife in The Theory of Everything. I thought she was fantastic in that movie. Again, I want to, imp I don't want to make it clear here because I have some friends who are probably going to beat me up after this. <laughs> I didn't dislike the movie. I liked it a lot. I, I'm going to buy the Blu-ray when it comes out and, and thoroughly enjoy it in the future. I just felt that the movie was lacking and that if this continues to go on, it's going to make Star Wars much more, much less profitable, much less enjoyable for audiences because it's just going to become the next thing where people go and see it and it's like, oh, the new Star Wars movie's out. Because eh, yeah. oh. right now everyone's riding high. It's like, Star Wars movie, man! <laughs> like, if anything, I loved more about seeing that movie. We saw it over at the Hollywood Palms in Naperville, which is a wonderful theater. Absolutely. And, and they brought in the, uh, the 501st Legion, who, is the pe who are the people that do these elaborate Star Wars cosplays. And just seeing the drive and pe love people put into this into this movie, they were dressed up as some of the most obscure characters, people you would not expect to be dressed up as cosplayers. Like, some guy had a Darth Revan costume from uh, yeah. Knights of the Old Republic. Some, one woman was dressed as Padme. There were random assassins and droids and everything. Yeah, it was, it was exciting for me. I've, I haven't been to very many premieres uh, 
in my movie and watching history. But and so this was this was very exciting, and I I enjoyed the the excitement around it. But oversaturation is definitely a concern that that Disney should have and and Star Wars should have. Um, really, I I don't want people, even though I've I'm gonna really piss off a lot of viewers right now, but I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan. Sci-fi in general, not really my thing. Which is why I chose you for this. Uh, yeah, we, we, we enjoy our controversy. But uh, yes, it's, I, I absolutely love them as movies, as stories, but uh, the, the world just doesn't appeal to me as, uh, as a more reality-based movie would. However, for those who do enjoy the world, like you were saying about The Hobbit, um, it's, it's just a fantastic time to, to be in this world again, even if it is um, every year, and that, that might be kind of, like I said, oversaturation. Again, the thing I think is best about the film is the fact that it really goes into the world building, especially. Which, yeah, if, if you, again, if you're a fan, that's you the, will absolutely love being in the world again. That's the real strength. I, I love the scenes where you just see little details like, the little stormtrooper doll, or mm. you get to learn about the fact that there are like monks who get like really in touch with the Force, or you get to see like how bad like and how morally un, un like, not good the rebellion can be at times in the face of like this horrible like unceasing empire. But as I said, if it, this is if this is the kind of movie Disney wants to make Star Wars into, they're going to go from a place where you have people like the Five O First Legion, like these cosplayers, like these fan films who love the series so much, and you're going to watch them every year, you're gonna see them become less and less prevalent because it's going to go from a thing that really drives passion and really drives people from being in love with Star Wars, and it's going to become the next cynical thing. I mean, I love the Marvel movies, but they are starting to get more cynical. They're starting to get a little more samey at times. I, I was about to bring that up as well. Um, Star Wars at, at this point is, is only making one movie per year, Whereas Marvel is releasing uh, two or three a year. Well, the advantage of that is that those aren't the same movies. You get a Captain America movie every two years, so it's. But you still see in the box office they're making back their budget, of time and time again. Um, Civil War, I think, was is cracked the top five highest grossing movies of all time, and that was what o over the tenth movie in that in the MCU franchise. Yeah. So, I I don't know if you can say that that uh, moviegoers are getting cynical about them because they're clearly still going to see it multiple times. Sure. And I think the same will be for Star Wars, maybe even more so because it is a more established property that people have been in love with for over, what is it, almost 40, 40. years now. Yeah. All right, I hope that's true. That's been our discussion for Rogue One. You'll come back for the, for the final segment where we'll be doing his movie recommendation, and we'll sign off. See you, stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to our final segment of the Fox Valley Film Critics. We're with, with uh, now that we're at the final part, I'd like to uh, have uh, AJ kindly offer us our film recommendation for the week. Well, for all you Star Wars fans that are excited for next year's movie, the the next in the saga movies, Episode Eight. It's episode, episode Eight, unlisted. Do they have they named it yet? There's a trademark thing okay. that's going around. It, it I might thought not be I heard real. something around there, but it might have been just an internet it's made a up thing. You never know. Uh, anyways, the director of that, Ryan or Rian Johnson, uh, who has made some excellent movies in the past. Most of you have probably seen Looper. I know you were talking about that earlier. Excellent, excellent sci-fi movie. But if I'm not mistaken, his debut, or his, director, his directorial debut, was a movie called Brick, which I have seen and I very much enjoy. It's a uh, neo-noir, very stylized, with Joseph Gordon-Levitt as the lead. It follows this kind of very, almost, uh, over dramatic, but on purpose kind of mystery that takes place in uh, in a regular high school, and uh, it's just a fun ride uh, to watch Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, um, you know, figure things out, but still kind of uh, act like a high schooler at times. Um, it's like I said, very stylized and. Uh, 
um, yeah, an enjoyable time. It definitely fits in with our theme of the uh, the Orson Welles movies. Yeah, so. yeah, it's 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 a great noir. Um, I think it, it can go right up there with any of the classics: Maltese Falcon, Third Man. Um, I've seen the first thirty minutes, so I will officially confirm that it is perfect. There's no flaws. It it really is. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's there's some uh, great moments of darkness as well that that are filmed, even though the film is in color. Uh, the shadows in some of the scenes really uh, play a part in it and uh, make it really, uh, really realistic. It's got a very, um, it, it, strikes a, it's, it strikes a great balance between realism and stylization that uh, is it, hard to do. A lot of films, um, Tarantino comes to mind, go for all style. And a uh, little, and a, f and a few movies kind of go a little too real and make it boring for the viewers. But Brick strikes a great balance, great time for anybody who enjoys a good mystery. And uh, who can say no to Joseph Gordon Levitt? Definitely. Well, with that, we're out of time for today. Since this is our inaugural episode, I'm going to rely on the teleprompter for this because I'm not going to remember this all. Thank you so much for tuning in to our inaugural broadcast. Uh, if you're watching this on FV TV, you can find our recordings of our show on the Group Things Productions YouTube page, as well as our weekly podcast and other, episode, other things we've done in the film industry. Uh, I'm the operational manager of Group Think Productions, and we do all sorts of things. Um, as, I'm a sound designer by trade, so I've done short films and stuff like that. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at AntisocialCritI. That's critic without the, I, the C at the end. And you can, if you want to find more film reviews, video game reviews, general articles about the film industry, you can find it at theantisocialcritic.tumblr.com. I'm Tyler, your enigmatic host. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day.